Okay. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I guess, can, can everyone hear me in back? Okay, cool. Yeah, so first, thanks so much to the organizers for uh, asking me to talk about this. I'm, I'm really uh, happy to be talking about this, uh, what I find to be a very exciting subject um, that's kind of emerging uh, in the last like three or four years um, uh, as a really um, you know, prominent application of quantum information to cryptography. Um, and I want to basically uh, start this talk by like introducing you to like what I mean by certified deletion, talking about the basic scenarios, and then a couple more uh, advanced applications, uh, just to get you thinking about what uh, what's the basic idea of certified deletion, uh, what might be possible with it. And then I'll try to get into a, um, a way, like try to explain like a pretty general template for how you'd construct uh, cryptographic schemes with certified deletion um, in a way that like if you kind of understand the basic idea here, you can start, you can imagine how you might be able to like plug in a bunch of different crypto systems and obtain a bunch of different applications from that. Um, I'll walk through uh, some intuition or, you know, part of a proof for how to prove uh, security of these schemes. And then, uh, so at the end, uh, if there's time, um, the, the first part, you know, most of this talk will be about how to certifiably delete uh, information, messages, you know, plain text. Uh, but you could also consider um, Certify, you know, a different application where we actually want to certifiably delete uh, computer programs themselves, um, and so I'll I'll get into that a little bit at the end. Um, and please, like, feel free to stop me during this talk and ask questions in the middle. I'm very happy to answer questions uh, online. So, all right. So the basic. Uh, let me just make sure. I, okay. So the basic um, scenario of certified deletion uh, looks something like this. Um, we have Alice who's on her phone with some uh, data and she wants to basically uh, upload this data and store it on the cloud, right? Um, and she wants to do this in a way where the cloud, uh, you know, she wants to do it privately. So she wants to encrypt her data, send it to the cloud and use the cloud as basically just a storage device, right? So far this is a very uh, common um, scenario. And, you know, like I said, we're going to assume this is encrypted. Uh, even if the, the server is malicious, they shouldn't be able to recover uh, Alice's data uh, from this encoding, at least uh, in polynomial time. But the reason that I also have this uh, um, quantum encoding here, why I'm using this uh, cat notation, is because I want something stronger. Uh, and I want to say, well, actually, you know, Alice could request the cloud to return her data if she wants. or uh, at a later time, she's, she could decide that actually I want that data deleted. I would like to request uh, the cloud to delete um, that data. And there should be a procedure that the cloud can perform, maybe like some sort of destructive measurement. The cloud performs on the quantum encoding uh, to erase the data and produce a certificate that can be returned to Alice um, that she can actually verify. Um, so now uh, what... Um, can we hope for here? Like what kind of uh, security property uh, do we want? Um, one natural goal would be to say that, well, um, after deletion and after Alice verifies the certificate is valid, then um, maybe even if we give the server Alice's uh, secret key for the encryption scheme, or even if it's kind of leaked, um, then the server still won't be able to recover Alice's original data. Of course, before deletion, given the secret key, the cloud could just, of course, decrypt and learn D. After deletion, this shouldn't be possible. So this is a very, uh, I think, natural and uh, meaningful way to capture what it means for this data to be uh, deleted, All right? Um, you could even ask for kind of something else, which in some cases is, is a stronger guarantee, which is to say, um, well, after deletion, let's even allow the server to kind of become completely unbounded, right? They have unbounded time, they have unbounded resources, they could break whatever crypto system, at least computationally secure crypto system uh, they want. Even then, they shouldn't be able to recover 
uh, D. So in the case where like this encryption system was maybe public encryption or you know some some system where you could kind of uh, brute force recover the secret key, uh, the second goal is uh, in a strengthening of the first goal, and it really also captures deletion in a pretty intuitive way, saying that you know um, there doesn't exist information theoretically any more uh, information about D after this certificate has been been returned. Okay. So, um, you know, this is intuitively what we want. Uh, we can think about, uh, again, like, why did I use both, like, encryption and, like, quantum to do this? Um, well, first, we kind of need encryption uh, in the first place because we, you know, if, if the server could kind of uh, recover D from Alice's original encoding, then uh, this is kind of hopeless to do anything, at least against malicious servers, because they could just copy the data D, like save a, save a copy for themselves, and then kind of pretend to delete uh, the original copy. And this also leads me to the unclonability requirement. Uh, even the ciphertext here has to be unclonable, right? Otherwise, this same sort of cloning attack would work. Um, and so this is why we kind of need both uh, crypto and quantum to, uh, um, to get this, these type of applications. So this, I'll mention that this, this cloud storage type of application for certified deletion was first um, uh, brought up in this, in this work of Broadbent and Islam. It was expanded on uh, in this follow-up work of Hiroko Moramai, Nishimaki, and Yamakawa. And I would like to also mention one more thing before I move on, which is that um, classically, you know, th there's this other line of work that's been happening in parallel. So it started by Garga Goldwasser Vasudevan, and there's been some follow-ups now. Um, that studies uh, deletion in a classical setting. So this might uh, seem to contradict what I just said. But this, this, this line of work is really interested in, um, uh, you know, basically formalizing what it means for like completely honest servers to comply with deletion requests. And again, in a classical world, that's the best we can hope for, um, assuming your server is going to be completely honest. And this, this is kind of motivated by uh, complying with um, like laws that, um, that stipulate that, that uh, companies should uh, um, uh, respond to deletion requests. Um, but again, this is the best we can hope for classically. Uh, this talk is going to be about this like quantum setting where we can actually hope to obtain security uh, against uh, malicious servers. Okay, any questions about the basic scenario here? Okay, good. So uh, I want to mention a couple like strength things of this. Uh, a really exciting application, I think, is, is to also use this for um, kind of private delegation. So here, maybe Alice wants to use the cloud not just to store her data, but even to do something useful with the data, like uh, you know, compute some function on the data, uh, and kind of, you know, she's using this, the, the cloud to perform some um, expensive computation for her, and she still wants to keep her data private. Again, this is a, a well-studied scenario in the classical setting. And here we're going to ask for something uh, stronger, which is, you know, the cloud can return the output to Alice, um, but it can also kind of, you know, after computing this output, go back and kind of certifiably delete the initial uh, encoding of D. Okay, which should capture the fact that you know they can learn f of d, but after producing this this proof, they should have kind of statistically removed all information about Alice's original data d uh, from the encoding. So again, even if Alice's secret key leaked later, or they you know somehow broke the encryption scheme, they still wouldn't have been able to uh, recover Alice's original data. Yeah. Uh, uh, you can consider either. I mean, for example, uh, they're basically equivalent if you set f to just kind of like XOR the, the output um, with a random bit, for example. Oh, so you yeah. Like yeah, let's let's say that's why I'm just yeah that's why I'm just writing it as like learning it in the clear. Um, but yeah, you could also imagine uh, the server returning an encryption of f of d. Yeah. Um, but yeah, this the the guarantee the uh, the traditional guarantee here would be that like the server it would be some ideal functionality where like maybe the server only learns f of d and, and nothing else about about d. Right. Um, 
and good. So this uh, again, the the first uh, this application was 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 brought up, or, or it was you know Broadbent and Islam again asked whether this was possible. Uh, there's been some follow up works now that kind of uh, formalize uh, security uh, uh, more rigorously here and give uh, uh, constructions of this. Okay. Um, and the last, I'll, I'll mention one more application. I, there's a bunch that I could uh, choose from. Um, but another one that I find uh, pretty interesting is, is this combination of certified deletion with timed release encryption. And so here we can imagine Alice uh, sending um, a, an encoding to a party, Bob. And now the encryption that she's using is not like standard, uh, um, just uh, hiding. Uh, encryption against polynomial time adversaries, but maybe after time t, um, Bob can actually uh, decrypt and, and learn the output. So classically, this is called a timed release encryption or a time lock puzzle. Um, the twist here again is that actually, you know, before t uh, is up, maybe Alice decides, oh, actually, you know, I I changed my mind. I actually don't want you to learn what my data was. So can you please delete it, and and Bob can comply. Um, so there's a couple, you know, actually, uh, right. There's a, there's a few nice ap applications of this. I would refer you to Unru's paper in 2013 with, for an extensive uh, discussion. Um, you know, for example, uh, you could use this for wills, right? Like maybe Alice uh, writes a will, uh, sends it to her lawyer, Bob, and it's supposed to, you know, release after some number of years. But if she decides later that she wants to uh, change what's in her will and she doesn't want anyone to know what was in her original one, she could ask Bob to delete it. And then she'll uh, prepare a new a new encoding, right? Okay, uh, and I should say this original work of Unruh uh, uh, proposes timed release encryption schemes in like this revocable setting where this the the certificate is essentially a quantum state that is like the original uh, encoding itself, and this was later considered um, in our work uh, in a certified deletion setting where the certificate is a classical string. Um, and good. So again, there's there's other applications uh, by now. There's 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 a bunch, but I want to maybe uh, maybe this is enough to give you a, a sense of what what is certified deletion. What what can we do with it? Um, and I'd like to move on to giving you a uh, kind of a general recipe for how to construct these type of crypto systems. Um, okay. Any anything before I move on? All right. So let me first uh, say uh, some a couple just like really high level points about uh, what kind of approach I want to take here, um, and it's going to be really useful to to modularize, modularize. So let's think about like the quantum information component of this and the crypto components separately. Uh, this will help us, for example, like kind of design uh, templates that we can kind of uh, use reuse over and over again and plug in. You know, New crypto systems and get new applications and so on. Um, and this is like pretty. This is fairly obvious, but like, okay, I guess I mentioned before that like we really need unclonable uh, data. But what are we actually going to be using to get certified deletion? We're just going to directly take advantage of the uncertainty principle, right? That we can perform a destructive measurement and um, you know lose the ability to understand some information or decode some information that was previously held in the state. And in more detail, right? Uh, pretty intuitively, what we need are some types, uh, you know, some type of quantum state that can simultaneously encode information into conjugate bases. One basis will encode the plain text information, uh, and the other will encode valid deletion certificates, right? So if you kind of measure in this this other basis, you should be um, losing your uh, ability to uh, learn the plain text information. Okay. Um, Good. So, uh, what is the? There's a. You know, this leads me to a pretty general uh, type of state that has seen uh, you no know, use uh, all throughout uh, cryptography. So sometimes called the subspace subspace coset state, um, but it's a very general family of states defined by some subspace of f two to the n. I'm always going to be talking about like binary fields, um, and right. And uh, two vectors x and z. So also throughout this talk, when I you know when I say co of s, I mean a some like canonical set of coset representatives of the subspace s. 
Okay. And I'll, I'll kind of assume whenever I say S, uh, that also kind of describes uh, this like space of cosets uh, that I'll be sampling from. Okay. So these states are defined by S, a coset of S, coset of S perp. And it's basically just going to be a uniform superposition over all vectors in S plus X uh, with a phase defined by Z. Right. And the, you know, uh, the really nice property of these states is if I apply the Fourier transform, in this uh, case, just Hadamard's, right, I'm going to end up with uh, a superposition over S perp plus Z, where X is in the phase. So you can see already that basically, you know, in one basis, I have um, encoded a vector X. In the other basis, I've encoded a vector Z, okay, and I can kind of access either uh, uh, piece of information. And these states, uh, you know, as long as we sample uh, S and X and Z with, I guess, some randomness or sufficient randomness, then the uncertainty principle applies here. Um, even like information theoretically, if I, if I just give an adversary one copy of this state, it should be hard for them to produce both a vector in S plus X and a vector in S perp plus Z simultaneously. And naturally, you know, we're going to use one of these, like say X, to hide the plain text. We'll use the other data to uh, as a, as a certificate of deletion, right? Okay. So uh, given this um, set of states, this is kind of like the quantum information component of it. Let's combine this uh, with crypto to get kind of encryption schemes. Okay. And the notation here uh, I'll use is I'll say I'm going to call uh, C just some general uh, uh, crypto system. This you know you could you could think about this as being maybe a one-time pad or a public key encryption scheme, fully homomorphic encryption. You know a bunch of different things. But for now, let me just call that C, and I'm going to assume it has some associated decryption key uh, SK. Uh, I'll write H to be a family of hash functions, uh, which again, or which you should think of as being basically a family of uh, randomness extractors. And then uh, I'm going to be considering different distributions over the subspaces, the cosets, and I'll just write that distribution as D. Now, to encode or encrypt a bit B with certified deletion, um, this is the general template. You know, I'll just sample this information that's used to define a subspace state. I'll sample a random hash function. Let's say H has just one bit output. And my ciphertext is going to consist of the subspace state, and then an encryption of S. Um, and here, S is going to be, you know, S is what gives us the ability to like a, kind of understand what's in the subspace state, right? Like if I have S, I'll be able to recover X uh, and Z. If I don't have S, then I, then I kind of don't really uh, know what's going on in the state, right? So I'll give out an encryption of S, I'll give out an encryption of H, and then uh, I'll mask my bit my plain text bit B uh, with the hash of X. Okay, so here I'm hiding B with X, but I'm kind of like extracting randomness from X or like hashing it down uh, using H. Um, and kind of what I just said, like let's check that uh, we, you know, we need to check that if you're given the decryption key for our crypto system, then you should be able to recover uh, B. Like decryption should work here, right? And if I have the secret key, I'll be able to learn S. Uh, using S, I'll be able to recover X, right? I can just measure my state in the standard basis. I can understand the resulting vector as living in a coset of S, and then I'll know uh, which X I need to use to unmask the plain text B. Okay. So that's great. We can decrypt. Um, and then at this point, uh, deletion should be fairly intuitive, which is, well, instead of uh, measuring in the standard basis to recover a vector in S plus X, Let's say I, you know, instead measure in the Hadamard basis, right, to, to obtain some vector in the dual space, S perp plus Z. Um, and so that's the deletion procedure. And to verify uh, the certificate, which is this vector pi, I just need to check that pi is in S perp plus Z. Okay. Um, so, you know, this is just intuitively what I should expect uh, for a deletion. Um, basically measuring in the conjugate basis, uh, and we would hope that, you know, if you do that, 
or any malicious adversary potentially that does this and actually produces this vector in the perp space, they should lose their ability to kind of know anything about X in the future. Okay. Um, okay. So this is, uh, you know, oh yeah, let me, you know, let me just reiterate that we can kind of, uh, each of these components, uh, we can plug in various um, uh, things like, so for example, this crypto system can be one-time pad or public key encryption or, or many other things. You should think about this hash function as being a randomness extractor where the seed is this uh, H. And now I want to tell you about uh, different ways that we can instantiate this distribution over subspace states to get kind of various properties of, of this encryption scheme, okay? Um, so, so good. Um, there's, different, there's different ways that I can choose my subspace state uh, to optimize for like different, um, you know, aspects or, or properties of the encryption scheme that I want. So first, let me describe uh, how you would try to make this scheme as practical as possible, right? And, you know, to get practicality, generally, we don't want highly entangled states. Um, so I could just sample my subspace S as being uh, spanned by standard basis vectors, and this just gives rise to, oh, something. I don't know where my theta went, but there's supposed to be a theta there. Oh, it's on the, oh, it's on the second line, okay. <laughs> Uh, good. So this is um, this is, this gives rise to uh, Wisner, sometimes called Wisner states or BB84 states, right? Where actually my subspace state uh, defined by a subspace uh, defined by theta is just going to be these like single qubits, right? Either uh, depending on theta, either encoded in the standard or the Hadamard basis. The description of the subspace is just theta, and this is what the encryption scheme looks like, right? And so no entanglement required here. And we can hope that this type of scheme uh, can actually be, you know, implemented with today's technology and, and be a practical realization of, of certified deletion. Um, and this type of scheme was, was first described, again, in this work of uh, Broadbent and Islam. Okay. Um, good. So what if we want to optimize for publicly verifiable deletion? Uh, I think I mentioned in the last slide, you know, to check your deletion certificate um, what you're doing is you're checking that pi is in s per plus z, right? So that means you need to know what s per plus z is. And generally, we want to keep that information hidden from the adversary, right? So as I've described, kind of implicitly, I'm assuming there's like some privately verifiable deletion procedure. Um, but we can take this template and we can use it to obtain some public, publicly verifiable deletion if we sample s as dimension n minus one. So let's 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 take s to be just like one less dimension than the the uh, ambient space. So s perp only contains two vectors, zero and some vector v, right? Now, if I write down the resulting uh, cipher text and I look at it in the Hadamard basis, this is going to be my superposition over s perp plus z. S perp plus z only has two vectors in it. It has z uh, and z plus v. Okay, and x, which uh, represents a coset of s, s is, or yeah, x is just a single bit, right? S only has uh, one coset, uh, so it's either s or the coset of s. And what's the point? Again, like I want, I want to keep s perp uh, plus z hidden, but I can do that while allowing for public verification by basically uh, noting that there's only two valid deletion certificates in the scheme now, like only z or z plus v should be accepted. So what I can do is I can just publish a one-way function applied to z, and I could publish a one-way function applied to z plus v. And now, if I have these images of the one-way function, I have two properties. One, I shouldn't be able to recover z or z plus v. On the other hand, if I'm given a deletion certificate, which should be z or z plus v, I can actually just evaluate the one-way function on it and check that it equals one of these images. And so this is how I can, can verify uh, that the certificate is valid. Okay. This gives us publicly verifiable deletion. Um, and this was uh, first described in a work myself with uh, Dr. Chita Karana, Julia Malavolta, Alex Bremba, and Michael Walter. Okay. And good. So this is, um, 
I think this is what I wanted to say about public of verifiable deletion. The last property I want to describe is something that is a little bit more difficult to motivate right now, um, but I'll come back to it later. Um, and for, for lack of a better term, I'll call it publicly verifiable ciphertext. Here, I'm going to imagine just sampling S kind of completely uniformly at random, um, just giving you uh, the ciphertext that I kind of described in the last slide. And the property that I'm interested in here is that if I give uh, the adversary Oracle access to, um, you know, a functionality that accepts uh, kind of the correct vectors uh, that can be used for decryption, which are like all these vectors in S plus X, then I can hope that uh, security of this scheme still holds. This property is not true of like the, the first and second uh, um, schemes here, right? If I'm given a Oracle access and I can query and like, yeah, given Oracle access to the, a membership check for S plus X, in the BB84 case, uh, I, can, I can learn the subspace. In this publicly verifiable deletion case, I can also learn the subspace. Um, and this will give me some sort of way to authenticate um, my ciphertext uh, in a publicly verifiable way. And again, I want to return to this later in the talk. Um, where I can hopefully motivate uh, why we might want this property. Okay. So good. This is just. So I think this is all I wanted to say here. I guess suffice it to say, you know, there's a general template involving subspace states, and there's many different ways we can instantiate it to obtain kind of different um, desirable properties you might want from your uh, encryption scheme. Um, so I think I'm going to move on to how to actually prove security of these encryption schemes. Is there any questions before I do that? Cool. So let's get into security. Um, so the first thing uh, that I need to talk about here is how do we actually formalize um, certified deletion security? Okay. And here is a security experiment. I apologize for all the notation. but. That's stuff we've seen before, basically. So we have, we're parameterizing it by the a crypto system, uh, family of hash functions H, distribution D. And now I'm going to consider a two part adversary, okay, A1 and A2. And uh, this game is parameterized by a bit B, um, which is the plain text bit. So, okay, I'm just going to um, encrypt B using this like certified deletion scheme I described give it to the first part of the adversary, and their job is to output a deletion certificate pi, um, along with like kind of whatever leftover state they have, which I'm calling ST. So this is just kind of their uh, leftover quantum state. Um, if pi is not valid, then I just kind of want to throw the experiment away. So I'll just kind of sample a random bit B prime and output that. Otherwise, if pi is valid, I'm going to let the second part of my adversary output B prime. And their job is to try to guess what B is. But I'm going to also give them the secret key of the encryption scheme, right? So this is capturing the fact that after deletion, I'm going to, you know, explicitly leak the secret key to the adversary and then ask them to guess what was the original uh, bit that was encrypted. And of course, what we want, you know, well, what, 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 we, what we want here is that, um, you know, the probability that a, uh, you know, basically the advantage that our adversary has in this experiment is negligible. So depending on, you know, whether the original bit that they got was an encryption of zero or encryption of one, they shouldn't have any uh, noticeable advantage in, in guessing which is which. Okay. Um, so, so far, yeah, I think, I think that, um, you know, You know the, the construction and the security game um, are interesting and but and fairly intuitive. Um, I think the trickiest part of this this line of research so far has been like, can we actually prove like intuitively this is what we want? Can we actually prove that that's that we get that right? And there's a bit of a long history at this point in terms of like uh, works that show um, kind of different theorems about this security game. Okay. And the first one I want to mention again is this work of Broadbent and Islam, where they prove, uh, you know, what we want here in the green box. 
um, when our crypto system is a one-time pad, so it's kind of a one-use, information theoretically secure uh, crypto system, right? Uh, they take H to basically be any good enough like uh, seeded randomness extractor for a particular uh, source of entropy. They consider D to be sampling Wiesner states. And they let both of uh, the adversaries uh, to be unbounded, which is natural because we are dealing with, uh, anyways, kind of an information theoretically secure crypto system. All right, so they prove this. They they prove what we want in this setting. Okay. Um, so the next work I want to mention is so Hiroko Moramai Nishimaki Yamakawa said, okay, uh, that's great, um, but you know, one-time pad encryption certainly has its limitations. You know, can we can we get uh, you know, can we get something like this? Uh, you know, can we plug in more general crypto systems and get, for example, reusable secret key encryption or public key encryption or even like attribute based encryption, these other more advanced encryption schemes with certified deletion? And they do manage to show that um, as long as uh, the crypto system C satisfies this particular property called a non committing encryption scheme, and we now computationally bound. Uh, both A1 and A2, again, which is natural because our, our crypto systems might only be computationally secure, you know, then they can prove what we want. Uh, so this gives us, uh, this gave us a bunch of new applications. A limitation of this was this non-committing property, which, you know, not all crypto systems satisfy. I, I won't really exactly define what it is, but uh, there's some, certainly a lot of crypto systems don't satisfy it, and there are some applications that really seem to require um, going uh, kind of generalizing beyond just non-committing schemes. Um, and kind of the next improvement here was my work with uh, Doc Shito where we said, well, you know, we could hope that the security game is kind of uh, holds uh, when C is just like kind of a very general, uh, satisfies some very general notion of security, which is just it's semantically secure, right? So meaning that, you know, if I encrypt uh, S, uh, that encryption is going to be um, computationally indistinguishable from an encryption of zero, right? And so, you know, pretty much any most uh, crypto systems you can think of uh, should satisfy semantic security. Um, so this is one of our improvements here is to go from non-committing encryption schemes to any semantically secure encryption schemes. The other improvement I want to point out is that actually, you know, there's no a priori, so A1, this, the first part of the adversary has to be computationally bounded because they're receiving kind of a, a computationally secure um, encryption of S. But there's no a priori reason that we have to model A2 as being bounded because A2 is operating after deletion, right? And again, if we, if we want to capture the fact that after deletion, like there's statistically no more information about the bit B, we should model A2 as being a completely unbounded algorithm. So this we managed to prove. Um, and for any semantically secure distribution, I will point out there's one, maybe you could consider it a caveat of this result is that um, we only prove this for a very specific choice of the uh, extractor H, which is uh, just the XOR function, right? So basically uh, H is not a family of hash functions, it's just a fixed kind of unseeded extractor, which is just going to XOR all the bits of X together and use that to mask uh, B. Um, and then I'll just quickly mention there's another follow-up where we actually generalize kind of beyond semantically secure distributions uh, to something that we call a subspace hiding distribution, which has some applications. Again, I'll, I'll mention this a bit later. And here we actually crucially use the fact that we will s sample D to be like uniformly random subspace states as opposed to just uh, Wiesner states. Um, good, so let me also mention uh, that that actually, you know, many years before all this work on uh, certified deletion started, UNRU in 2013 considered actually a very similar security game um, under, you know, the name of like a revocable crypto system uh, and where the certificate was a quantum state. Uh, his constructions are slightly different, um, but um, I do want to, want to mention that, uh, you know, actually a lot of the techniques uh, that were used in this paper, I think, have kind of been recycled and, and kind of used again in the certified deletion context. Okay. Um, okay. Any questions about the security game or? Yeah. 
Oh, what was it? Oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, could you tell us about ST? Oh, yeah. ST is uh, the leftover state of, of A1. So it's it can be whatever state that A1 wants to output, be a quantum state that, we'll, that we just imagine passing to the second part of the adversary. Can they have prior information? Prior information about? B. Um, about B? No, I mean, uh, I think, yeah, you can. Yeah. Uh, state should not have prior information about B. Yeah. Not, yeah, I mean, that's. And it can be anything that A1 can compute, but supposedly you should not be able to compute B, right? It's like a generic. Any state that A1. Yeah, yeah. Oh, maybe I missed. So did, it depends what you mean by prior information about B. You mean like, I, I thought you meant like A1 is initialized with some information about B? Like, like, like some semantic security type of thing that A1 actually has a reference system and some. Uh... Sure. I mean, for example, if you're, OK, you could say, let's, uh, if I want to encrypt like a longer message, right? And um, I kind of just like repeat this like uh, many times. Um, this would imply something like, oh, the adversary just chooses two messages of its choice, submits that to the challenger. The challenger like kind of samples a random B and then and then encrypts uh, MB. Um, so in that sense, you know, A could know that I'm only I'm either getting encryption of M0 or M1. Um, but of course, like this B chosen by the challenger, that should be kind of uh, this plain text uh, choice should be sampled kind of outside of A's view. Um, and then to to just like what Yael said, yes, like the state here uh, is kind of anything at all that A1 could compute about the ciphertext that they receive. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so let's move on to, uh, I'll run through, you know, not a full proof. Uh, but maybe some some intuition about about what we can prove about this game, um, and I'll consider this a particular instantiation where I'll I'll consider C to be kind of a, a very basic cryptographic primitive, which is just a computationally hiding and statistically binding commitment. I'll take my uh, hash function to just be the XOR, kind of this unseeded extractor. Um, but what I really want to uh, show here is how you might prove. Um, Something about the case where A1 is computationally bounded, you know, so it's getting a, a kind of a commitment to its input, but A2 is unbounded. So at the end of the day, what we're getting is this sort of like everlasting security property um, where kind of before deletion, there is some computational security. After deletion, we're getting statistical security. Okay. And let me rewrite my, you know, in this setting, uh, I can actually uh, rewrite. Um, what I want to show in this way that's like, that I think is slightly simpler, which is, let me just consider one part of the adversary, A, which is going to be computationally bounded. They get the, encrypt, they get the ciphertext. They produce, again, a uh, deletion certificate and a leftover state. And now I'm defining this experiment to just like kind of abort if the um, certificate is not valid. Otherwise, it'll just go ahead and output uh, A's final state. And now what I want to show is that the trace distance between you know, this uh, experiment when I encrypt the bit 0 and when I encrypt the bit 1 is negligibly close. So this captures the fact that A's output state contains statistically no information about B in the case where they've actually output a, a valid certificate. So this kind of implies uh, the security game that we want from, from last slide. And you know, I'm not going to go through an entire hybrid argument. Um, but I do want to think about maybe some of like the, the challenges that come up in the setting, why this is a little bit of a non-standard uh, setting, right? And kind of like the first tension that might come to mind is like, well, here we want to show this like statistical claim, right? And if we're going to do like a hybrid argument, like all of our hybrids must be like statistically close because at the, at the end of the day, we want to show some statistical closeness. On the other hand, we're going to have to crucially use uh, some computational assumption, which is that this commitment is computationally hiding. Um, 
So that means we can't just kind of directly switch to a hybrid where somehow we've switched the commitment uh, to S to a commitment to zero. Um, so we're going to have to be a little bit more clever in how we take, you know, how we use the computational security of the commitment scheme. Uh, so, so that's one thing. Um, <clears throat> the other thing that will just, uh, that will motivate kind of our first step here is, um, is related. It's, it's just thinking about, well, you know, A receives basically a statistically binding commitment to the bit B in this first message, right? Um, but we want to show at the end of the experiment that the state no longer has information about B. So how are we going to do that? The first hybrid uh, is going to be helpful towards, towards doing that, but it's a bit of a weird step maybe. What we're going to do is we're just going to say, you know, actually I'm going to consider uh, kind of taking, uh, you know, replacing uh, B, or replacing this masked version of B with like kind of a uniformly randomly sampled B prime. Okay, so as the challenger, I'm just going to give the adversary just a random bit B prime. And only at the end of the experiment am I going to check, OK, was my guess correct? OK, if it was incorrect, I'll just abort the experiment. So essentially what I'm doing is I'm just kind of like with some probability one half, I'm just kind of throwing out the experiment. Otherwise, it looks exactly like um, hybrid zero. So um, since B is just one bit, I can show that maybe I've halved like the trace distance here, but it's still okay if I can show that the trace distance in hybrid one is negligible, that will still imply that the trace distance in hybrid zero is negligible. Um, okay. And what I've achieved here is I've basically uh, delayed the dependence of the experiment on the bit B until the very end. Okay. Uh, and that will help, help me argue that um, eventually B is statistically um, not uh, part of the adversary's final state. And intuitively, what remains to show, well, if we can show that the vector X has a lot of conditional min entropy, meaning it has a lot of entropy, even conditioned on the adversary's view or their state, then we'll be good because we can use that entropy to show that the bit B is like completely masked and therefore that this experiment kind of doesn't have any dependence on B anymore. Um, so let me try to finish, uh, give like an outline of how you might finish the proof in, in one slide instead of trying to go through all the hybrids. Um, and again, this is what we want to show now. We've kind of reduced to this, this situation where we have the adversary, it gets this subspace state, it gets a commitment to S. Let's assume that it outputs a valid deletion certificate. We want to somehow argue that X has a lot of conditional min entropy. Okay. And a natural step a first step here is to purify the experiment over X. What that means is now I'm going to set up, like on the left here, I'm uh, going to set up this like challenger's register. So now my challenger will contain this like kind of superposition over all possible X's, which again, these are all like uh, cosets of S, entangled with the register that the adversary receives, uh, which are going to be these subspace states. And so far, I haven't uh, made any changes to the distribution that the adversary sees. Now, I'm going to apply this like very convenient change of basis, um, and this 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 U is going to be defined based on the subspace S, and it's basically going to be a mapping between vectors, uh, between coset representatives of S and vectors in S perp. Um, and you know, if these, in some cases, these spaces will just be the same. Um, but not in every case. Um, but in, that, in this case, U is basically just Hadamard transformation, right? Um, but I can define it to be a, a little bit more general. It's basically just like kind of a, a nice mapping between cosets of S and then vectors in S perp. And if I apply that mapping to the challenger side, what I see, basically what I'm, what I'm showing here is that from the adversary's perspective, they get a uniform mixture over cosets of S, okay? But that's equivalent from their perspective to getting a, uh, a uh, uniform superposition where the mixture is over the phase uh, V, okay? Again, this is kind of like a generalization of like the claim that like if you get kind of a mixture over zero and one, that's the same as a mixture over plus minus. It's just kind of generalized to, to our setting. Um, and if I write the state that the adversary receives in the Hadamard basis, it becomes very simple. It's, it's just 
a mixture over Hadamard uh, basis states. Okay, and now I can use the computational assumption uh, to prove the following claim. Okay, basically from A's perspective, they're just getting a random uh, vector v plus z in s perp plus z, and their goal is to output a vector in s perp plus z. If I'm sampling s uniformly at random, right, then there's kind of like no way for the adversary to um, you know, basically the only thing that the adversary can do is kind of directly output the vector that I give them, right? Um, of course, they're also given a commitment to S. So uh, in order to prove this claim, we have to use the computational hiding of S. Um, but this is okay. We're, we're not really defining like a new hybrid. We're just proving this claim that um, if adversary is given V plus Z and their deletion certificate is valid, then it must be equal uh, to V plus Z, okay? And I do want to mention that like, this is true for uniformly random S. Uh, in the Wisner state case, S is not uniformly random, and this claim is not quite true. Um, but we can, uh, you know, things get a little bit more complicated, but basically the same proof technique will apply. Okay. So the point here is that this is a way to basically formalize the fact that A really must kind of be measuring their state in the Hadamard basis and kind of directly outputting that. So we can apply this projection to the challenges register and say, you know, if adversary is outputting pi, then I know that my register as a challenger must be um, pi minus z, right? It must be this particular vector in S perp. So we can kind of view this, everything going on the left, going on on the left is just like one projection I'm applying to the challenges register. US uh, project onto pi minus z, reverse US, and what I'll see is that I can apply this projector, I won't disturb the state except by some negligible amount, and now my uh, challenges register is in, an, in a nice uniform superposition over all x. And so what that means is that if I measure this uniform superposition, I'm going to get a random x completely independent of A's view, and this is essentially how I argue that x has uh, a lot of min entropy, uh, even from A's perspective. Okay. Um, Good. So that was uh, maybe, you know, that was definitely the most technical part of this talk. Um, and if maybe uh, what I just kind of want you to take away is that um, here, what we're doing is we're using the computational security of the commitment to prove a, a claim that if I introduce a projection to the system, uh, then it will kind of accept with overwhelming probability, mean like, meaning that like this this uh, joint state of the challenger and adversary kind of satisfies this, some nice property, and then I can use that property to argue some claim about uh, the min entropy. Okay. Um, all right. So uh, this is what I wanted to say about security. Um, now I won't really return. Uh, I wasn't really planning to return to the applications that I started the talk with, but hopefully at this point I've covered enough in terms of like the general construction, how you might prove it, that you can imagine if you go back and kind of like, you know, plug in stuff like public key encryption or fully homomorphic encryption or timed release encryption, you should be able to kind of satisfy these, these applications that I um, started the talk with. Okay. Um, good. So at this point, I, I kind of just want to say, say a bit about um, this uh, this topic of certifiably deleting computer programs, um, and I also just uh, just want to ask if there's any questions before that. Yeah. yeah. Where did you use binding in the proof? Maybe you don't use binding. What did I use? Oh, not a, yeah. So that's that would be for. Um, so in the proof of like in the proof of uh, certified deletion security, you don't use binding. Binding just gives you the fact that like the encryption scheme itself is a binding, like. Uh, so this this first message that A gets, this is a statistically binding commitment to B, uh, that we prove satisfies um, certified everlasting hiding. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So so this also holds even if binding it doesn't hold it. Oh, sorry. This proof it, itself holds even if you don't have a binding. Yeah, yeah. This this proof is just uh, for the hiding part of it, so it's kind of independent of whether the uh, commitment is binding or not. Yeah. Okay. 
All right. Um, good. So my, my plan for this last part is just to introduce uh, this notion of obfuscation with certified deletion uh, and indistinguishably obfuscation with certified deletion. I'll mention a couple applications of this notion. And I'd like to then spend a little a little bit at a, like a very, very high level comparing it to other um, notions because honestly, like at this point, like there's so many different unclonable primitives in the literature. It's like really confusing, like what what means what, I think. Um, and I, I'm not gonna claim to like give anything like very concrete, but I just kind of want to situate uh, you know obfuscation with certified deletion into this like into this landscape of uh, unclonable primitives. Okay. So um, if I want to think about now the ability to certifiably delete programs, um, just like in the like kind of the information or like the plain text case, we're going to need both encryption and unclonability. So when I think about encrypting programs, that is just exactly the the notion of obfuscation, right? So that's why I'm going to write obfuscation with certified deletion. Um, and our rough goal here is to take a program F, encode it into a deletable quantum state with a property that, you know, before deletion, uh, the, the program is going to be useful in some way. Um, and after deletion, it, it's not. And whatever, you know, there's many ways you could define the program being useful. Um, but this is kind of the rough goal. And, you know, a candidate construction for this is kind of exactly following uh, the template that I've described earlier in this talk, except that instead of encrypting a bit B, um, so I'm still going to use subspace states, but instead of encrypting the bit B, I'm going to obfuscate uh, the program F. Okay. And for those um, that are not familiar, a, a program obfuscator is essentially like a one-way compiler. So it's, it's going to be a, a program that takes the description of a, a, of a circuit and outputs an obfuscated circuit that you can still use. You can still use that obfuscated circuit to evaluate on whatever inputs you want. But it should somehow have like hidden all of the secrets that were kind of hard-coded hard in that circuit, right? So this candidate construction consists of an obfuscation of this program P where I've hard-coded S and I've hard-coded um, the description of my function f masked with x, right? And so this program will, will work as follows. It'll take as input some, uh, some y that I want to use, or this y is going to be the input to my program f that I actually want to learn. Um, and it will also take as input a vector v. And the program will interpret that vector v as a coset of s. It will use the resulting vector x to unmask uh, f tilde, and it will take the resulting f and apply it to y. Right, so we can, we can kind of check that correctness works. If, if I have this, uh, this um, ciphertext or this obfuscated program, and I have an input y, what I can do is I can just evaluate the obfuscated program on y and in superposition over s plus x, and this should allow me to learn uh, f of y. Right, um, and I can do this for any input that I want. Now, so f as I've described this so far, there's actually an issue uh, with security, which is that you know there's nothing preventing me from like querying this obfuscated program on kind of invalid uh, vectors that are not e that are not in S plus X. You know, so if I, I know if I query on a valid vector in S plus X, I'll get a correct answer. But maybe I can potentially like mess with my vectors a little bit and kind of potentially learn uh, evaluations of functions whose description is not f but is like quite related to f. And uh, this might allow me to learn more about the function f than I should. You know, intuitively, I, I, I'm hoping that like all I learn are, is like the input output behavior of f. Um, but if I can kind of like, you know, play with the description of F and kind of like learn these invalid outputs, I can potentially leak information about how F is actually um, implemented. Okay. Um, so the solution here is to, if you remember uh, back near the beginning of the talk, where I said, you know, we might want to, to have some notion of authenticity uh, for, my, um, for my subspace state. 
here's where we're going to use it. I want to say that my program P only accepts authentic vectors uh, derived from, from the state, right? And the way I'm going to do that, you know, one way to do that is I could say, oh, I'm only going to call S plus X the authentic vectors. That would um, force me to basically um, hard code the vector X into my program P, which I don't want to do because I would not be able to get everlasting security in that situation. What I can do instead is basically sample a random superspace of S plus X. I'll call that T plus U. I'll hard code that into my program, and I'm going to call the vectors in T plus U to be authentic vectors. And the point here is that even given kind of like, you know, Oracle access uh, to this space, T plus U, it should be hard for the adversary to query on any authentic vector that's not just the vectors that it received in its original state, uh, S plus X. So this is basically as good as saying like, you know, I'm only going to allow you to evaluate um, on authentic vectors S plus X and allow you to learn like, you know, true evaluations of F. Okay. So this is more or less the candidate uh, that we have for, for obfuscation with certified deletion. So what can we prove about it? Um, so first, if we, you know, assume something very strong, basically, if we model our classical obfuscation as implementing an oracle. So we say that, you know, I'm only going to let the adversary kind of access this program uh, via Oracle access, then we can show something very strong and like basically uh, very intuitive, right? Um, which is that before deletion, uh, you know, the adversary kind of gets access to this obfuscated program and they can use the Oracle to learn any f of y for any y of their choice, okay? And they can do this uh, repeatedly until they measure their subspace state in the Hadamard basis, produce a deletion certificate, and at this point we can show that even if the evaluator kind of queries the oracle like an unbounded number of times, like they can totally learn the description of the oracle, they won't be able to learn anything more about the function f, right? So this, this captures a very intuitive notion of what we might mean by certifiably deleting a program you know, before deletion, you can evaluate the program. After deletion, you kind of completely lose your ability to evaluate that program. Okay. All right. Um, so fine. Although we are, uh, in order to prove something like that, we do have to model the obfuscation as implementing kind of a black box obfuscation, which we know for uh, some contrived circuits is kind of impossible to do in the real world. So what can we show if we don't want to assume uh, oracles? So here we'll consider the notion of indistinguishability obfuscation, which is a notion which says that for any two equivalent circuits, um, the obfuscations of those circuits should be computationally indistinguishable. Um, so basically kind of like I'm computationally hiding how the circuit is implemented. Okay. Um, and the way to kind of lift this to a certified deletion setting Again, I think it's pretty intuitive. It's just to say, well, IO with certified deletion means that, you know, after I delete my obfuscated program, this computational uh, um, guarantee should now become a statistical guarantee. So after deletion, my obfuscated programs should actually be statistically close, right? Meaning that, like, you know, maybe before I had some, uh, uh, you know, computationally hidden information about how the original program was implemented after deletion, I've kind of uh, removed all of that information from my view. Okay. Um, and, you know, I won't really get into it. We, we have to like slightly modify the construction from the last slide to satisfy IO with certified deletion because of some like IO subtleties. Um, but it works. And even if you're seeing IO for the first time, it's, I think it's pretty natural to think that it's, it's a sort of a weak guarantee, especially con compared to just like this Oracle uh, definition where like obfuscation means you literally only get kind of black box access to the function. But you can show that IO and something called differing inputs IO uh, with certified deletion are quite useful. Um, for example, um, I want to think again all the way back to the beginning of the talk where I described this like this this really nice delegation application where you know Alice sends her data to the cloud and the cloud returns with um, an evaluation for her as, as well as a certificate of deletion. Actually, we can achieve this uh, from standard assumptions like LWE, but um, 
using like an interactive protocol where even after Alice sends her first message, she has to do like quantum operations like afterwards and interact with the server. If we want to achieve just kind of like the, the syntax that I described earlier in this talk, where it's literally just two messages, like Alice sends a quantum encoding, she receives like a classical output and a classical deletion certificate. Um, the only way we know how to do that uh, as of now is using uh, uh, IO with certified deletion. Um, okay. And uh, another thing that I want to describe just in the last uh, couple of minutes of this talk is we can use obfuscation with certified deletion to give a generic compiler that takes an encryption scheme and gives us an encryption scheme with revocable secret keys. Okay. So what do I mean by uh, revocable secret keys? This is a emerging area now, really just in the last uh, one or two years, which considers um, you know, taking an encryption scheme and not saying, OK, I want to delete ciphertext. It's saying, I actually want to delete secret keys. Right, so it's kind of a dual notion in some sense. So here we have an encryption scheme where secret keys are quantum states. Okay, and um, there's this procedure that I can apply to a secret key uh, that produces for me a certificate that can later be verified. And the intuitively the security that I want is that you know if I'm if I have this like quantum secret key I can I can decrypt ciphertext, but after I delete or revoke my secret key, um, you know, freshly generated ciphertexts that I see are now semantically secure from my perspective, right? So um, I'm kind of no longer able to decrypt uh, ciphertext once I've deleted the secret key. So again, a pretty natural kind of like dual notion of, of uh, certified deletion uh, when applied to encryption schemes. And, you know, a natural way that you might think to do this is to say, well, if we have obfuscation with certified deletion, let's just take like any encryption scheme, uh, take the decryption functionality and encode that using like IO with certified deletion. This gives me, this gives me a, a quantum secret key that I can still use, but then I can also destroy, right? And we, we show that essentially this, this compiler uh, works and we can prove it's secure. Um, okay. And another nice perk of this is if the IO scheme is publicly has publicly verifiable deletion or revocation, then we get publicly verifiable uh, revocation here. And although I don't have time to talk about it, there is uh, this really nice uh, line of work that is, you know, still probably very active. I would assume um, in getting you know this notion of revocable like encryption schemes with revocable secret keys even from just like standard assumptions and this was started uh, by Kitagawa and Nishimaki in the secret key setting there's more recent works by Agarwal et al and Anant et al that study this in the public key setting um, and these results are basically uh, you know they don't they don't use IO they they use um, kind of uh, different techniques and they show that you can actually do this um, from standard assumptions um, in the privately verifiable setting. Okay. Okay. Good. So I just uh, I just wanted to mention this as like a related or arguably like included in certified deletion uh, literature. Okay. So now uh, this is like um, I guess my second to last slide. As promised, I do want to say a little bit about how this notion of like certified deletion of programs relates to some other commonly studied uh, unclonable primitives. And so the kind of the most, uh, yeah, the most famous example of, of a, general unclon on a general unclonable primitive in this setting would be probably copy protection, which is defined by Aronson. And it asks that, you know, if, if my adversary is given a program, it's hard for them to produce two working copies of the program. And what do I mean by working? Again, that's kind of like up to the authors of the paper. Um, there's like many ways you could define what it means for the program to be working. Like there's like a, a distribution over circuits, distribution over challenges, like does the program output the correct answer? You know, I'm not gonna get into uh, different ways that people wanna define this, but this is gonna be like a very like high level discussion. Essentially, copy protection is saying you can't produce two working copies of the program. Unfortunately, it's a, it's a very strong primitive, it seems, and it's uh, fairly difficult to construct. So there's this really nice work a couple years ago, um, Anant and Laplaca relaxed copy protection to something that they called secure software leasing. Okay, 
And here, uh, the goal is not is not to prevent the adversary from just producing two working copies of the program. The goal is to prevent the adversary from um, outputting two like kind of publicly authenticated working copies of the program. Okay, so um, this is something that they call infinite term secure software leasing. As far as I can tell, this notion of copy detection uh, defined in this this uh, work of Aronson et al. is a very similar notion, which is basically just saying, well, yeah, it's hard for me to produce two copies of a program, each of which, uh, you know, anyone can come and say, like, yes, this is actually like an authentic copy of the program. Okay. Um, and they also kind of uh, relax this further to something called finite term secure software leasing, where like kind of one of the copies is just kind of like a privately verifiable uh, certificate. So um, in my view, the, uh, the notions of like, uh, uh, um, you know, publicly verifiable deletion or re revocation of, of programs kind of fits in between these two notions, copy protection and secure software leasing, where we want to say it's hard for the adversary to produce kind of one working of the copy of the program. We don't care whether it's authenticated or not along with some either publicly or privately verifiable uh, certificate, right? So um, you could have this public verifiable setting, which we have from IO, or this private verifiable setting, which um, has been constructed in like the, the works I described in the last slide. Okay, so again, this is like a very high level discussion. Um, there's a lot of subtleties that come up when you, when you describe, when you define what does it mean for the, co the copy to be working and so on. But, Somehow, I think this like notion of like encryption of uh, like obfuscation with certified deletion kind of lives between copy protection and and secure software leasing. Uh, okay. Um, all right. Now I just want to yeah I think I'm nearing the end of my time. I'll just uh, say you know a couple of questions that came up. I think there's like a, a bunch of future directions. Um, here, I'll just mention a couple of things that kind of came up as I was uh, preparing the talk, kind of related to things that I was saying. And, you know, we can think back to the, just the, the basic, like, certified deletion experiment. And, like, if you remember that slide with, like, the history of, like, all these uh, works kind of bit by bit improving or generalizing what we can show, I think there's still um, some things that should be true. We just don't know how to prove it yet. You know, for example, if we like for efficiency, right? If we want to not just include, not just encrypt like one bit per subspace state, uh, maybe we want to encrypt, you know, super log logarithmic bits, maybe polynomially many bits per subspace state. I don't know how to get the proof to work because the first step in that proof was just to kind of guess uh, that bit, if you remember that guessing step. So that is like really lossy. Um, again, I think this is a limitation of the proof technique, not necessarily what should be secure. Like you can hope to use the entire description of the coset to hide, you know, as many bits uh, as you want, um, or as many bits as uh, are used to describe the coset. Um, and then, you know, when we again, when we generalized uh, the proof to work for semantically secure distributions, we had to fix one choice of the hash function. We had to say, oh, it's going to be the XOR function, um, and I don't know how to get the proof to work if we kind of use a seeded random extractor, which again might help with kind of in, uh, encrypting multiple bits um, instead of just one. And also maybe related to this is robustness to noise. So actually, uh, again, this work of Broadbent and Islam in the one time pad case, they do show that they're, uh, they can prove their protocol is robust to, to noise. So like these, the quantum states that they send, they can assume some are kind of uh, you know, noisy or corrupted during transmission. But as far as I know, uh, generalizing this beyond just the one-time pad case is still uh, not done and open. So this is this is another thing that would potentially make these applications um, more amenable to use uh, in the real world. Uh, yeah, something I, I this this kind of just recently came up in the last couple of slides is you know we can do publicly verifiable deletion of information from standard assumptions. Uh, and we can do privately verifiable deletion of secret keys from standard assumptions. But getting publicly verifiable deletion of secret keys, for now, I only know how to do from IO. So can we do that from standard assumptions? That's, that's open. And I think another great direction is just like kind of what I touched on last slide. We definitely need a, a better 
more rigorous, uh, more useful understanding of the relationship between all these unclonable primitives. Um, you know, this work that was presented on Monday of Ananth, Kalioglu, and, and Liu, you know, does a great job in kind of starting this research program, and I think this should uh, deserves more attention as well. So, so great. Thanks a lot for listening. <laughs> Are there any questions for James? It's not maybe direct or obvious, but uh, do you have any thoughts about maybe relating these publicly verifiable notions of revocation to something like public quantum money? That uh, yeah, that actually uh, that's a really good question. As I was like writing the slide, I was like. Maybe the reason we don't have this is because it somehow would imply uh, public publicly verifiable quantum money. I didn't see that it immediately would, but I think um, I don't know. Actually, I think that's that's definitely a good direction to to think about. <laughs> yeah. Other questions? Along the same line, we were we heard earlier this week about proofs of destruction, pseudorandom states, mm. proofs, of dis proofs of destruction, and we know that those proofs of dis destruction are useful for publicly verifiable quantum money, actually. So yeah. I was wondering um, if you've thought about that, if, there's, if there are links. Yeah I, didn't, I, I, yeah, I didn't include proofs of destruction in the last slide, but maybe, yeah, proofs of destruction are, are definitely related. Um, I think you could basically lump them in with like revocable programs for a particular definition of what it means for the program to be working. I guess like a pseudo random quantum state is with a proof of destruction is one where you can, it works because you can produce another proof of destruction, right? So it's, it's not like you can evaluate it on a bunch of different inputs, but it's like a program that you can use to um, provide like a verifiable proof of destruction, I guess. And you can, uh, you can apply this notion to like signature tokens as well. And so I think it, it very much like fits into this. Um, and again, it's another thing that I would say should be um, investigated more in terms of like the relationship between the primitives. Yeah. Uh, thanks. Um, here comes an experimentalist question. So I, I guess um, you want to store all those things with quantum memories, right? Um, yeah. Um, so um, of course these are not perfect, and you will have some decoherence and so on. And you, you had this this mentioning of the noise properties and so on. And I'm yeah. just interested because I mean there's two things: you will have decoherence, but um, practically I want to avoid big quantum error correction, right? So can you do error correction classically and then? just bound uh, kind of the influence of decoherence on your validation step, the quantum part? Yeah, I think maybe, I think maybe Anne would, can confirm like in, in, in your work, I mean, you do just use classical error correction, right? And you have uh, um, still like, you know, you're just transmitting single qubits and you really only have to store uh, the single qubits. Um, as, in, as in like, in order to get, robustness to noise, I don't think you guys required any sort of entanglement. So, so yeah. Um, I, again, at least in the case where we're using like, you know, Weissner states, we can hope uh, to avoid the use of entanglement even uh, while getting robustness to noise. Yeah. Hi. Um, so, for um, copy protection kind of stuff, or like at the, at the like at the top blast in this diagram, like um, one of the abstractions that have been studied is like monogamy of entanglement. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you go down and think of something like tokens for signatures, we think about more as direct product hardness. Mm -hmm. So when you talk about uh, revocation or certified deletion, uh, what do you think is uh, the right uh, form of abstraction in this sense? Oh. The right. Yeah, I don't know if I can speak to what the the right thing is. I mean, I know that. Yeah, in this in this work on the next slide, I guess they have uh, this Ananth et al. work. I guess they show that you can prove kind of one time pad encryption with certified deletion go, by going through a monogamy entanglement route. Um, 
It seems to me potentially like overkill in the sense that you, really what you're proving is this like entropic property, right? Or like yeah, entropic uncertainty relation seems to be like more fitting with like certified deletion. Um, but that's not to say like, yeah, I mean, monogamy entanglement is obviously very related and, and might still see use cases even for certified deletion. I just, I just don't know. Yeah, I don't know if I can say what the, what the right abstraction is. Yeah, yeah I, I think I should rephrase. Um, so I agree, like I also feel like monogamy of entanglement would be an overkill. But like, do you think something like direct product hardness would be useful in the certified deletion sense? Ah, so direct product hard, I, uh, near the beginning of the talk when I said um, these subspace states satisfy this like uncertainty principle, that's basically what has other people have referred to, I think, as direct product hardness, right? Like the adversary can't output both a vector in S plus X and S per plus Z. That's, is that what you mean by direct product hardness? Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, it's more, more like it's more of a, like a tokenized signature kind of a, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. guarantee. And like, but is it useful for certified deletion that? Yeah, I mean, I think implicitly that that's that's being used in the proof um, without calling it like direct product hardness, I guess. Um, I, yeah. Because when you talk about everlasting security, uh, once you have deleted the state, um, I don't see how you can directly make the connection template wise, because it's all saying that you cannot produce two things at one time. Yep. Um, sure. So if, yeah, the, again, yeah, the proofs don't directly go through like a step where we say, okay, it's hard to output these two things. And that implies everlasting security. It's it's going like a more direct route to everlasting security. Of course, like under the surface, you at least need that property. But I think, like you're saying, you kind of need something more in yeah. order to get the everlasting security. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Let's uh, thank James again.